And we throw around these numbers all the time. And I think it's important just to stop for a minute, and make sure we all know the construction of all this. So the state of Texas has 6.25% of that. So, so a fairly large percent that we're sending to the state of Texas from our sales tax. The city of San Antonio separately has 1% of that. And what we're looking at tonight is just one piece of this last line, which is the additional 1% that voters can approve in any given city for particular sorts of projects. And we are at that cap right now. So that extra 1% is the most the city can add. And so we are currently at the cap of 8.25%. So I think that's important to understand. Now, the measures we discussed tonight uh, are, the 1% is shown in the pie chart in the table at the bottom. And so within that 1%, all we're really talking about are with these three ballot measures are the green and the purple slice of the pie. And uh, these are shown in the bottom table as the pre-K for SA, of course, and the expiring Edwards Aquifer and Greenways trails. So both of those have one eighth of a percent, one eighth of that one percent that is in question here. So I just wanted to go through the ballot measures logistically real quick before we get into the substance of it. So the first ballot measure, and it's a little confusing because there's two prop A's. Uh, the first ballot measure is City of San Antonio Proposition A. And that question is going to be whether or not, this is the simplest one, whether or not to, to extend pre-K for SA for eight additional years. So if that passes, we simply continue to pay that one eighth of a cent that we have already supported. If that measure is not approved, then the program ends and we stop paying that one eighth of a percent. Now the second ballot measure is City of San Antonio Proposition B. And this is whether or not to use that one eighth cent that had been dedicated to the Edwards Aquifer and Greenway Trails and transfer that now to ready, for, ready to work SA program. Now if approved, that eighth of a cent for the ready to work program would start being collected when the Edwards and Greenway tax is finished being collected, which would be sometime in 2021. And if approved, that would be collected until December 31st of 2025. So it has a hard end date, no matter how much money has been collected from the eighth of a cent, that's when it would end. If it's not approved, then we stop paying that eighth of a cent because the Edwards Aquifer and Greenway Trails program is not on the ballot. So if Proposition B does not pass, we simply stop paying that one eighth of a cent at least until 2026, and that'll come up in one second. And just wanna make this clear, the Edwards Aquifer and Greenway Trails programs would not regain that eighth of a cent solely because Proposition B is not approved. And then finally, we have the ATD Proposition A, the Advanced Transportation District Proposition A, and that's how it appears on the ballot. Now, if approved, that eighth of a cent, the same one that had been used for the Edwards Aquifer and the Greenway Trails, would go to the ATD for transportation projects beginning on January 1st, 2026, and continuing in perpetuity. So if both San Antonio B and ATD A pass, B would have it until the end of 2025 and then would pass it on to the ATD. Uh, but whether or not Proposition B passes, if ATD Proposition A passes, it won't start until January 1st of 2026. And just the last piece of this is that if any of these fail and one or the other of these one eighth of a cents are floating around unused, in the future, council could consider placing another proposition on the ballot, but that could not happen because of state law, which requires you to separate your sales tax elections. That could not happen until May of 2022. Uh, so hopefully that helps you. Oh, and just wanted to put in a plug here for the vote411.org. Uh, if you need information on any ballot issues, it's a great place to go uh, for all this information. 
So um, hopefully that helped and uh, we can take the visual off now and we will move to our first panel, which is going to be City of San Antonio Proposition A. And I will just set the stage for this and then I will introduce our two panelists. So uh, Proposition A again is uh, to continue to dedicate the sales and use tax for the pre-K for SA early childhood education program. It would renew the adoption of the sales tax at the rate of one eighth of 1% for the purpose of continued financing of authorized programs of the Early Childhood Education Municipal Development Corporation for a maximum period of eight years. So this one does have an eight year uh, limit on it. The goal of pre-K for SA is to improve the education of San Antonio's youngest learners in order to improve the knowledge and skills of the San Antonio workforce within one generation. And it includes uh, four elements of demonstration schools, uh, which serve over 2,000 four-year-olds in full-day pre-kindergarten programs, parent trainings, professional learning, and grant sharing successful teaching methods. So we will have two panelists and they will each have five minutes we are starting each of these with the side in favor. And all of our panelists tonight have wonderful backgrounds and long bios, but we are going to go with very short, uh, just given the titles that are relevant to the issues we're talking about tonight. So um, on the fore side, uh, we have Kate Rogers, who is a member of the Keep Pre-K for SA campaign committee. So again, Ms. Rogers will be supporting, uh, arguing in favor of support, of Proposition A. And on the opposite side, we have Councilman Clayton Perry, and the Councilman has represented District 10 in San Antonio City Council since 2017. So we will start with Ms. Rogers, and each of you will have five minute presentation. And I'm, I will follow up with a lot of good questions that we have received from attendees tonight. Uh, so Ms. Rogers, the floor is yours. Well, um, good evening, Dr. Romero. Thank you to you for hosting this into the League of Women Voters. Um, so from historical perspective, as you mentioned, especially for those who may not have voted eight years ago or uh, been part of that uh, really uh, important uh, initiative, there was a committee that was formed by then Mayor Julian Castro that was co-chaired by Charles Budd of HEB and General Joe Robles of USAA, and it included community, business, education leaders from across the city. And the charge from Mayor Castro was to say, if we were to invest this one eighth of a cent in something to improve our future workforce and the future of our city, what would it be? And that committee, after about a year of analysis and hearing from experts all over the country, settled on early childhood education, where um, national studies from University of Chicago, Rutgers and others have shown time and time again that the return on investment usually hovers somewhere around 13%. Um, for dollars invested of public money invested in high quality early childhood learning. So back then there were five promises that were made to the voters of San Antonio of the program. The first was to nurture responsible citizens for San Antonio, to become a national leader in childhood education, to build a sustainable workforce for the future, to elevate education and family prosperity, and to use the funds to maximize the impact of the program citywide. So eight years later, we fast forward, and since that time, um, the program Pre-K4SA in total has served more than 450,000 four-year-olds from throughout San Antonio. And the question is, um, how, how do we arrive at that number? Because I think what's most known to most voters are the four centers, the centers of excellence, which you described early. Um, earlier, and those serve about 2,000 children per year. That's who is enrolled in that, and that serves a wide variety of populations that are defined, defined by the state, not the least of which is our military families who are eligible to receive free pre-K at those four centers. And since the beginning, the, the staff and the board at Pre-K4SA had the foresight to do a robust evaluation of the program really from the get-go. And a UTSA longitudinal study that has been, been conducted on the first round of, of uh, graduates of the program who've gone on to take their third grade uh, reading test and math test, the STAR test that's administered by the state, 
shows definitively that those four-year-olds perform better on both math and reading and they have better school attendance than their peers who either did not attend a pre-k program or one that was not as high quality as pre-k for SA. Um, so that's the four centers. In addition to the centers, as you alluded to, Pre-K for SA also awards competitive grants to other early childhood providers, parochial schools, and others across our community every single year. And since the beginning, they have awarded more than $21 million in grants um, to over 52 different organizations throughout San Antonio to help improve the quality of those programs at the same time. In addition to that, the Pre-K for SA staff um, offers very high quality professional development and learning for early childhood teachers across San Antonio each and every year. And when we say early childhood, we mean teachers teaching all the way up through third grade. And, and right now, um, as defined by the state, teachers in those early years are required now to have a reading certification. And Pre-K for SA is offering those reading academies to our school districts and other providers at no charge. So since the beginning, they've served about 10,000 educators per year for a total of 218,000 hours of quality professional development that's been delivered. And time and time again, we hear from our district partners um, how well received that professional development and learning is by the educators. And then the fourth pillar has been family engagement. And I think that during the past few months, as we've watched the pandemic unfold, you've seen some examples of that by Pre-K for SA offering food distributions, job referrals and support for families, um, uh, delivering hotspots and devices so families could stay connected, but also even offering a innovative partnership with books, early learning books, so that children throughout San Antonio could have access to high quality literature at a time when maybe they couldn't get to the library um, to check out a book. So family engagement has always been one of the pillars and um, Pre-K for SA has always served as a model on that front. So we talk about specifically the return on investment. Um, the return, uh, there was a separate study that was conducted by Penn and by uh, the, uh, Columbia, the Teachers College at Columbia. And that study showed that the return on investment is even higher for pre-K for SA than other programs across the country. So we're looking at about 13% on average, seven to $10 for every $100 invested. But in, in San Antonio, that return has been uh, shown to be about $156 for every uh, $100 invested. So that's almost $4,000 per child. Um, 16,000 uh, for the families who've benefited, who also have uh, the luxury of having those pre-K centers open until 6 p.m., which is a wonderful benefit for working families. And then about $7,000 per year for the community or $59 million that's been returned in benefit over the past eight years. Um, so I think, again, great foresight on the part of the early organizers and conveners to um, really measure in a very careful and thoughtful way the program's impact from the very beginning so that they could be confident in saying that they delivered on those promises made to voters. And so what does this mean for eight years going Ms. forward? Ms. Rogers, your time is just about up. Yes, so eight years going forward, I think what, what we hope is that it will allow the program to serve families at even uh, a wider range of income levels uh, to be able to open the program up to those families uh, earning as much as $65,000 per year, in addition to current eligibility, which is about $45,000 per year. Um, so that's all I have. Again, I want to thank you for the time uh, this evening and the opportunity to be with you. Okay, thank you. And we will uh, have time for questions as we move along. Uh, Councilman Perry. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for Welcome. hosting this this evening. This is, this is great, great opportunity for people to learn. First off, I want to say that I am not pre-K uh, against that. I think that's a wonderful program. But let me tell you what I have a problem with. I have a problem with the city duplicating a, a program that we've never been in the business of education before. And Part of the problem I have is that we have a city charter that inside it, it tells us where our core competencies are, roads, streets, firemen, policemen, drainage, 
libraries, that kind of thing. Nowhere in it does it say that we should be providing education services. And that's where it starts at. So I've gone back and taken a look at this. Uh, we, we should not be in the business of running an entire school system by the city. We have school districts. We've got private schools. We've got charter schools. We've got Head Start programs. We've got all of these other professional agencies, uh, I'll call them agencies, but school systems out there running very competent school systems. Um, I, I just don't think that we should be in that business of educating our, our youngsters. And to top that off, we're actually being double taxed. And that's what people really need to understand. We're being double taxed because the state legislature, the last, last legislature, they actually approved full day pre-K services for our public schools. So they're now offering that and they're setting that up and they have been, they've been offering that as well. So really, are we trying to compete with the public school system? Uh, I don't think we should be at that point. So we're actually being double taxed. You're paying property taxes, you're paying school taxes, the state is taxing also, and then helping to fund some of these programs. So you're actually being double taxed by providing a separate school system that the public schools, you're already paying for that. I don't think that's right. And, you know, we're, we're talking about 2000 students and I've heard over, over the last eight years that there's probably a, a population of about 40,000 kids that could, could receive that service. And we're only servicing 2000 and, and uh, we're paying and we've been averaging $40 million per year for those 2000 children. And I'll get to a little bit of that a little bit later also, but those 40,000, um, $40 million per year, do the math on that for 2000 kids, that's $20,000 per child. The state pays about $9,000 a child. So look, just do the math on that. It's, it's very simple. And I don't agree with that. Uh, the admission is free for about 75% of that 2,000 children and the others are actually selected by a lottery system. So it's not all just for the, the very needy here in San Antonio. It's for a lot of different children around San Antonio. So $20,000 per child, no. Uh, it was mentioned about grants being given to other school systems. Okay, that's great. That's about t over $20 million for the last eight years. And, but there's no metrics for that. You ask for the metrics. Where, what's the data that shows that they're, we're getting a good you know, return on investment? Actually, that's my phrase that I've been saying on city council since the beginning. But what's the return on investment on that $20 million for the last eight years? And they're projecting over $20 million again over the next eight years. So... They're saying 450,000 students have been uh, uplifted and so many teachers. I would say, well, let's stop spending $40 million per year on our system and fund $20 million over eight years that you get a much bigger return, 450,000 students versus only 2,000 per year in our school system. Let's turn that around. Let's, let's go ahead and do the 450,000 students for only $20 million over eight years. So um, to me, that, that shows a good return on investment. Um, you know, and what is quality education? You, you hear that a lot. I say that our public school systems and charter school systems do offer quality education. You'll hear that they don't, but let me tell you, you go out and tell one of these public school teachers or charter school teachers that they're not a quality teacher, uh, you'll probably hear something different from them. I, I, I just don't agree with saying that this is the only system that has quality educators. Uh, I think we have plenty of quality educators in these other school systems. So I just wanna say that more money does not necessarily getting a better service. And that's basically what we're doing, paying more money double taxing our residents here in San Antonio and others traveling through because this is a sales tax. It's not just San Antonians, but other people coming through town, spending, spending their, 
vacation dollars, that kind of thing, which is great. But and I need you to wrap up your comments. Okay. You're basically being taxed twice for this system. And are your dollars really being spent wisely by continuing this program? So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, well, let's get right to this question, because this was uh, the most common question we got from uh, several citizens. Uh, so during the last legislative session, as Council mentioned, uh, House Bill 3 was supposed to fund full day pre-K for four-year-olds. Why would San Antonio need to supplement that funding? And Ms. Rogers, we'll start with you, and if you can speak to the three, please, so we can get to a couple more questions. Yeah, so um, what I would say to that is, so House Bill 3 was a... a, a a great, a wonderful step in the right direction on the part of the state legislature. And it did a number of things, but one of those was at long last um, funding for full day pre-K for currently eligible populations. So I think the, the hard part about that is that there's only four populations that are eligible for pre-K in the state of Texas defined by the state. So if you're in the foster care system, if you're a military dependent, if you're an ESL learner, English as a second language learner, um, those are uh, some of the criteria. It didn't actually expand the option for high quality full day pre-K to other children. Um, so to, sort of to think that that was gonna fix the issue, um, it's wonderful, but it, it's not gonna get us there. Nor did it uh, offer uh, aftercare services like pre-K for SA does for working families. So it just gets you to the end of the school day, if you will, for a four-year-old. Um, so I think that's the big thing. The second thing is that because of the pandemic, our state budget heading into the next le uh, legislative session is quite precarious, right? We took a double hit, not just with sales tax, which hit us in the local level, but also at the state level, but also um, oil and gas. And um, things look quite uncertain for the budget for the next session. And so uh, I think the campaign feels very strongly that this is not the time to back away from our local investment in our children and in our future. This is the time to double down on a national model that we have created that we should take great pride in. People come from all over the country and the world to study how we've done this in San Antonio with voter support. Um, so now is not the time to back away from that. And I wish that House Bill 3, I hope and pray that it will remain intact through the next session, but we just don't know that at this juncture. Okay, thank you, Councilor. Yeah, um, I think it's gonna stay. I think there was a big push for it last time and talking with other legislators uh, that we have around San Antonio, I think that's gonna stay. It's an important requirement for them. And why do we wanna, you know, continue funding this program when the state has already stepped up to do it. And they will, I, I'm sure that they're going to continue to do that because not only here in the city, but at the state, you know, the economy is turning around faster than we thought it would. And yes, there's still deficits out there. I don't want to say deficits, but shortfalls uh, from our previous legislature. But uh, I think they're going to find those resources available to fund this program and to keep it going. So again, I don't think we should be double dipping and paying extra for the same service that's already being funded by the state to open it up uh, for full day pre-K services. And uh, I think that's a disservice to our citizens and to our economy here uh, in San Antonio. And I, I just might add that some of the metrics that were mentioned you know, some of those metrics were saying you're going to get this return on investment when the child goes out to get a job. You know, they're only getting through third grade right now. How can we predict what they're what they're going to be making in in the economy? I've seen those numbers also. So I just I just wanted to say that you know a lot of you know, presumptions are being made on what this program is going to give us back in this city. Okay, thank you. Um, and I wanted to get back to the study that you mentioned, um, Ms. Rogers, and I saw a comment about this from a citizen that, and, and I guess this gets into the weeds a little bit about statistical analysis, but when you have findings that show uh, that there's an impact uh, for students who attended pre-K for SA and then they do well in third grade, what controls were put into that study to ensure that there was not some other factor that's impacting both of those? For example, simply coming from a home environment that really pushes studying that could cause both those things, 
how do we know that, that it's pre-K that's causing the third grade performance? Yeah, and I, I mean, I would say with all due respect to the councilman, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't question people who spend their, their lives doing research and evaluation as a formal practice. I will say that this was a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard in research and evaluation. So this was a group of students, a cohort of students who were paired up against a like cohort of students to compare the results, right? So um, in a randomized control trial, that's the gold standard in terms of trying to isolate any other influences which, which might have impacted the cohort. Because the thinking is that within the, the cohort that received the intervention, in this case, pre-K for SA, versus the one that didn't, those variables would all be at play in the same 400 children. So in this case, it includes 400 children who were part of the, of the uh, cohort who received the intervention and 400 children who didn't. And the profiles, the demographics, the home situations of those, of those two cohorts would have been relatively the same. Um, and I, I just wanna say that um, I think that the other thing I would like to mention on House Bill 3 is that it wasn't like the passage of that bill meant that the districts had that money to stand up pre-K overnight. You, you know, there are facility questions at play. There are teacher hiring questions at play. Um, so it wasn't like all 16 or 17 of our local school districts were going to be able to turn on a dime in the next two years. And they have several years to implement that program um, and be able to offer full day pre-K um, beginning with this next school year. And now they've been set back even further because of the current situation. Okay, Councilman Perry, um, especially on this question about the study, did you want to respond to that yeah, question? Sure. Um, you know, I've seen lots and lots of studies over my lifetime. Um, and I, I respect the studies, but at the end of the day, you don't know what those results are until it actually happens. For example, you know, these studies were, were taken at, at the third grade level, which is great, but what education influences are there from third grade through 12th grade? Are they gonna maintain to be the best students out of, out of everybody? Or are they gonna still learn at the same pace and be, you know, at the same levels as their, as their you know, peers graduating from high school? or even beyond going into college. We don't know that here in San Antonio because we haven't been, it, been there yet. But I would say, again, I'm, I'm all for this, except not paying it out of city resources. Let the state do it. Let the education experts, the public school systems, the charter school systems, the private school systems, those organizations that have been doing it for multiple years, I mean, decades. I mean, how far does this public school system go back to? And parochial schools, private schools. I, I say let them who have been doing it continue to do it and not get the city involved because every time you get a city involved or a government involved in any kind of program, I'm talking in not just this, but any kind of program, you add bureaucracy, you add waste, and, you know, it, the list just goes on and on and on. And it's a mushroom. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger government programs. And that's what I'm against. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you both so much. Uh, we have limited time for each of these. Ms. Rogers, we really appreciate your being here. Thank you. Councilman Perry, we will see you again uh, for the third item. Yes. So we will move on then to Proposition B. Proposition B is the Ready to Work SA Workforce Program for job training and scholarships. Uh, this is for the purpose of financing authorized programs related to job training and the awarding of scholarships. And this, this one, just so you see, when you see this on the ballot, it's a little bit confusing because the same municipal development corporation that is used for pre-K pre for SA will be used for Proposition B. So it's a little confusing when you see San Antonio Early Childhood Education Municipal Development Corporation is listed on this one as well. So our two panelists for this one, uh, in, in, and I know it seems, it always sounds awkward to say you're against uh, something and I realize there's a little more nuance to this, uh, but in support of this, we have a councilwoman, Dr. Adriana Rocha-Garcia, who has represented District, District 4 since 2019. 
And on the opposing side, we have Councilman Roberto Trevino, who has represented District 1 since 2014. And you will each have your initial five minutes. And I really miss having the lead people here so they can help me with timing. Uh, but when your time is up, I'm going to raise my pen. Uh, so Councilwoman Rocha Garcia, we will start with you. Thank you. Thank you for the Sorry, I think, sorry, I think it said that I was muted. So SI Ready to Work is the opportunity to improve the future of San Antonio by voting for a program that invests in training, upskilling, certifications, and access to educational attainment that would essentially begin to break the cycle of generational poverty and the unfortunate legacy of economic segregation in our city. SA Ready to Work gives folks the opportunity to take care of their families for a lifetime, creating upward mobility for families who have been left behind for many generations. And the best part is that there's an entire ecosystem at work supporting them. I'm so sorry, here we go. Thank you. Sorry, yes. Um, we're working with the community colleges and the universities to look at how we offer wraparound services to make sure our participants make it through the program successfully. I recently read an article in the Heschinger Report that pointed out that unemployed folks will need to acquire new skills and that colleges can help with this through restructured learning opportunities that make learning accessible to those who can't participate in traditional learning environments but can benefit from weekend, evening, or online programs. The reimagination of learning will include on the job training and more importantly, adjust to the job market in a timely manner by offering programs that meet the current job market. We've also engaged many community partners with successful proven track records, including Project Quest, uh, who we are modeling the program after, and by the way, has an ROI of $19.32 for every dollar invested, and boasts a 90% uh, uh, placement record for its participants. So I'm glad that we're modeling this after a nationally recognized model, and it's not just Quest that has been uh, successful. All of our uh, community partners are experts at what they do, and they will partake in the intake, the assessment, the training, and the employment of individuals enrolled in the program. In fact, I listened to Managing the Workforce podcast on the Harvard Business Review last week, where they referenced our investment in job readiness programs and the impact on family sustaining wages. Um, and in the last few minutes of the podcast, uh, the host, Joe Fuller, who's a Harvard business professor, said that not in his lifetime had there been a level of instability in the workforce combined with a very rapid and accelerated rate of change in business that has heightened the issue of economic inequality. He acknowledged that programs such as this can make America more competitive for the future of the world economy and gives uh, more Americans economic independence. He also said that he hopes more municipalities and states start emulating what we are pioneering in San Antonio. And I'd be happy to tell Dr. Fuller uh, that in San Antonio, employers have been at the planning table with community members since this summer. We had Toyota, HEB, Valero, USAA, Rackspace, and local chambers um, meet together to, to, uh, to dedicate some time to build up this educated and upskilled workforce. And this isn't the first time that we hear that they want this. We have been warned about this for years. This just puts that plan into action. The chambers also advocated for on-the-job training opportunities for both corporate and small businesses. And this plan builds that in. And an example of our current workforce efforts proves that there's already excitement for this. Since September 28th, we've had 23 local small businesses partner with us, offering 136 on-the-job training opportunities. But it's going to take all of us. It's going to take your support and a continuation of these public-private partnerships to get our community back on its feet. Consider that this morning, 50 of our neighbors began four-week training sessions to become cybersecurity associates, automotive technicians, bookkeeping and accounting clerks, IT customer service um, uh, specialists, and they're also taking general ops and business management. And I do have to brag that the leadership at Port San Antonio and District 4 had an innovative solution to training during a pandemic and repurposed an old gym with plenty of space into a training facility. And that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take all of us working together. And yes, we each have our parts, uh, but we are one community supporting the essay ready to work to support a collective vision for San Antonio. Um, and, and I want to just remind you all that SA Ready to Work fills a void by giving individuals access to skills training that will help them with placement and in-demand occupations. It'll take some persistence, but together I think that we can do this. Many economists have already shared that- Council, um, I need you to end your comments. 
Sure. Um, that we uh, we there will be a disparity in job losses different than the recessions in ninety and two thousand one and two thousand eight. So we have to be specific uh, and purposeful about how we're investing in our uh, training. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Trevino. You have five minutes, and I will wave my pen when you're getting at the end. I'll be looking for that pen. Thank you, thank you, uh, Francine. Thank you, uh, uh, League of Women Voters, for this opportunity. Uh, since 2000, residents uh, have been able to vote on the 1A cent sales tax to continue to help fund the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program and the Greenway Tra Trails Program. However, they were robbed of the opportunity to do so at this time and are being directed to now vote on the new proposal for the use of the 1A cent sales tax. There's still no solid answer or direction on what will happen to the Greenway Trail and how it will continue to be funded. Edwards Aquifer impacts everyone. The new proposal only impacts a select group. When I send sales tax usage, it's 38 million plus annually for four years to help about 10,000 people annually. Uh, this program is focused on initially assisting residents who've lost their jobs due to COVID-19. However, it leaves out seniors, those disabled who cannot work, there's no mention whether or not this would also support our undocumented citizens. And what about those who simply want to go back to the jobs they once had? So far, workforce development has been funded, it has been funded at a total of $75 million. 75 million, 2.7 million from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, 10 million from other federal grants, and $62.3 million from our general funds. Why? So we can park that money in a time that we need it the most. We have simply parked that money because we know we can't spend it by the end of the year when the other federal, when federal funding uh, requires us to spend that money by the end of the year. <clears throat> so far, uh, we're now asking for an additional $38 million over the course of four years. That's $3,850 total for every person to go to school. The cost to go to school to San Antonio College, if a student lived with their parents, would cost approximately $8,745 a year. I guess I just don't understand the math, and I'm pretty good at math. Emergency Housing Assistance Program has been funded $57.5 million to date. That money has assisted 17,284 households with a city average of three people per household. This means that this funding has helped approximately 51,852 individuals. Housing assistance supports all in the vulnerable population. 46% of those impacted by this were children under the age of 18. That's 23,852 children under the age of 18 have been supported by this program. If we're gonna be redirecting funds from the 1A cent sales tax away from the Edwards Aquifer Program and Greenway Trails, then it should go towards programs that support everyone like the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program and the Greenway Trails Program. I simply have concerns. And to me, it's a question of balance. The current market doesn't have a skills gap. It has an opportunity gap. This isn't me saying it. This is the Brooks Institute. Brookings Institute. There's also concern for many in our community that, that feel that who will receive this training? Those who need it the most or those who are closest to success? Unfortunately, this is not being driven by the needs of the people, but the interests of business. It is time to listen to the, to the voice of our most vulnerable. I wanna point out to you from the Brookings Institute one of the things that we that we that is ignored in social dynamics uh, in the skills gap narrative is things like race, class, age, and gender bias in the hiring process due to racial segregation and stunted access to professional networks. Many talented Black, Latino, or Hispanic, and Indigenous workers never get a real opportunity to compete for key jobs in the emerging economy. Again, you know, the, the issue is for, for me about balance. And the key is that I think we need, to, we need to find a way to make room for things like housing in our community. Thank you. 
Thank you, Catherine. Um, so again, uh, there's uh, some questions that have been repeated quite a bit, and this is the most common one. Uh, Councilwoman, we'll start with you, and I'd really ask you both to keep your answers fairly brief so we can get quite a few questions in here. How will you measure the effectiveness and success of the workforce development program? And what specific promises are being made about this program that is measurable and useful for accountability? Sure. Well, um, thank you for that question. And so definitely we are, uh, we are fortunate right now in that we've already had some allocation uh, to workforce. And so what that means is that we are able to see what is working successfully and what is not working. Uh, and so we would be able to adjust uh, and we really have the opportunity to pivot and really change uh, as we learn. And so the beautiful thing about this is that working together with our partners, we have access to data. The city has already invested in, in working with 311 and ITSD. Uh, we are looking uh, specifically to see why people might not be getting enrolled in programs if they're applying for it. We're also, once we have training, which just started last month and we'll have some more metrics to look at to see what programs are, are successful, what programs are helping people get placed in jobs, and so the opportunity then um, becomes to really use the data that we have to be able to make powerful decisions to change something uh, going forward. Okay, Councilman. Well, I think that that's that's uh, important to point out that the that there is no accountability and and there doesn't seem to be any metrics attached to this. Uh, many council members have asked about this. I'm one of those that uh, doesn't have a, an understanding or. Uh, a, a clarity on the plan. And we're being asked to vote on this. It feels almost rushed. Uh, so, you know, I think people need to, to fully understand that. And I'm, I'm on this panel today because I have those concerns. The metrics simply aren't there. And uh, I just want to make sure that we are truly taking care of our most vulnerable. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman, I know you alluded to this, but a citizen asked this, and, and this kind of spans um, Prop B and, and the ATDA, uh, so I'm gonna ask it here. Uh, the EP, EAPP funding is neither secured nor guaranteed. The future of maintenance and planned expansion of Greenway Trails program is questionable at best and could very well be eliminated. What do you say to voters who feel essential and successful programs being abandoned midstream by redirecting these funds? Councilman, we'll start with you on this one. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I, you're right. I alluded to that in my comments, and it's it's unfortunate that a, a program, two very very popular programs that have proven uh, their success and have have been have proven their popularity, aren't given a chance to be on the ballot to continue. Uh, the 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 issue for me is again that that we're rushing through something, and there's this new program that sort of took the place of a program that we all know that is so important. And the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program is popular because water is something that everybody needs. And the Trailways Program is, is, is popular because it is truly connecting our city in, in the most wonderful and unique way. Uh, and, and it's going into neighborhoods, uh, vulnerable neighborhoods that is helping to improve the quality of life in those areas. And we're sort of stopping midstream. And I, I just th I think it's unfortunate. It's not very clear. Okay, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, Dr. Romero, I would say that my residents can't wait. And the residents that are dying of COVID-19 because they have not had access to health care and to a healthy quality of life um, just can't wait. So I, I would make that argument. But I've also uh, noticed, and, 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 and I voted for this, we have found a very creative solution that allows our CFO and our team flexibility to be nimble enough to use opportunities such as commercial paper to yield a faster return. And so when we're looking at uh, also the commitment that the, the county has made, and they voted for this uh, back in March, a, a commitment, and then also we've had a letter of support from the judge, um, we are actually working together to really try to figure out how it is that we can continue uh, this investment as well in our aquifer. This is not an either or. We can do both of this. And I think that the solution that our city staff has brought forward was something and the re something that was very valid and creative and the reason that I decided to support it. And so I, I definitely think this is not an, an either or and that we can achieve both of this. And it looks like we do have a solution, um, whether, you know, whether, whether folks uh, choose to acknowledge that there is that um, commitment already or not. It, it, it's there and it, it's been time stamped. Okay, thank you. 
Um, this is a pretty common question too. We'll start with you, Councilwoman. What measures, if any, will be taken to, mi taken to mitigate the possibility of losing trained workforce seeking highest paying jobs, with, which may be outside of San Antonio? Um, and then on, so how do you guard against people taking advantage of the training and leaving San Antonio? And then a question from the other side, the reverse, um, what about people for coming from other areas moving here just for this opportunity who are not in fact currently San Antonio residents? Sure, so the focus is obviously on San Antonio residents and what, the, what we are, have specifically been working on is marketing to people who actually do need this. And so uh, the way that we've been partnering right now with our different organizations and, and also doing some reverse marketing, if you will, we are targeting the city census tracts that have an equity at a score of eight, nine, and 10. People of color, women, veterans, formerly incarcerated, disabled, homeless, elderly, and those experiencing poverty. So so the efforts uh, include door-to-door -door engagement and then also marketing through the Financial Housing and Recovery Center that highlights this job training support. So if people find out about it outside of San Antonio, um, it, 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 it might be by, by way of, yes, they're listening to the Harvard Business Review. However, we have been specifically focused on targeting these, uh, these folks who really need it. Um, we've been sending text messages and robocalls to folks who have received the emergency housing assistance. We, uh, assistance. We've also um, it, done virtual call-ins, um, social media specific to uh, neighborhood associations. We're partnering with different organizations, community organizations. So we're getting the word out to the community that most need it. Um, again, specifically focused on, on these poverty tracks, which by the way, we know that COVID has uh, uh, impacted uh, disproportionately. And so we continue to to do our targeting uh, and, and what is really going to keep people here is a quality of life. And so what we get to do when we give access to better jobs, we create an overall quality of life that also benefits us as a community. So beyond that, the social return on investment is going to be um, far greater than, than, than folks can imagine. We have successful programs that have already done this. But when people make more money, they buy houses, they eat at full service restaurants, they shop retail. Just think of the revenues that the city, county, school districts, and other taxing entities will benefit from when folks have the ability to actually spend money it's an investment that we feel confident in making and it's an investment for all of us uh you know again the the that's that's just not data those are just promises and i you know i'm concerned because you know here i'm holding up a the figure that says 154,000 displaced workers in san antonio as of july 17th uh, this is about balance, and and I, we've been funding as a city uh, workforce uh, development for for many years, and I support that. Again, the point is is that we shouldn't be building something on the backs of our most vulnerable. We also have programs that help uh, with housing, help with homelessness, and uh, those things will suffer. Uh, you know, we were we, we just heard that uh, the Edwards Offer Program is going to be funded uh, through our general fund. Uh, those dollars are taken away from other city programs. Uh, they, they just are. It's just simple math. You know, the, every year we're fighting for every dollar to, to create programs that, that are helping those in, in greatest need. Uh, so, again, I, I just I think that, uh, you know, we're not taking into account uh, our seniors. We're not taking into account the, the, the many uh, food industry workers that, that simply want their job back and how can we help them stay afloat in this time that the city has asked them to stay home as we have, have asked people to, to put a pause on all this activity. We should be providing that support too and I just don't think we're doing that. All right, we're gonna have one more last um, fairly quick question here and I, I know it kind of echoes the first question I asked, but I wanna ask it again, because this was a more specific um, take at this. And Councilman, we'll start with you. Specifically, if this passes, who will oversee the program's financial and performance accountability? Councilman Trevino, we can start with you. On oh, okay, question. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. In fact, that that is, is what uh, also concerns me is that we know that it's 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 uh, it's off to, it's not off to a great start, and uh, and you know the fact that we're this close to to the election and still haven't really answered that or, or proven out uh, some of these uh, key questions uh, is very very concerning. Uh, we need to have some accountability when it comes to this amount of funding. We're talking about 154 
million dollars over four years uh, you know, to not have that clearly laid out or spelled out is, is something that that we should take pause. And uh, as a council member, I, again, I, I don't have that clarity. I don't know how the community has that clarity. There's many people who've reached out to my office to, to, to get a better understanding of how this will work. Uh, again, uh, I ask that we, that we have a, a, a better understanding of what workforce uh, development means in our community, right size it, and focus on our priorities. Those that are most vulnerable right now are impacted by this pandemic. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we need to respond to that. We have a fire and we're and instead we're talking about building fire stations. Thank you. Councilwoman, uh, can you give us a, the citizen a specific answer to that question? Who will oversee the program's financial and performance accountability? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to take a uh, primary workforce partners um, and the city to do this. And so the city has already, like I mentioned earlier, initiated a customer relationship management system with 311 and ITSD to create um, and, and, and track really uh, assessment and training referral processes. So this system will allow us to have better data collection, tracking um, re uh, regarding uh, maybe resident interest, timely partner agency follow-up, participant enrollment, and most important, like, like I mentioned, mentioned earlier, reasons for not enrolling. And so this is going to facilitate that data informed adjustment and let, let us recalibrate as the program continues to ramp up its pace. And so I'll give you an example of some of the, the, the questions. So um, some of our partners, they've already hired additional staff. They've already purchased additional hardware licenses. It's going to take scalability. And so if this program has only been in place for one month, I ask that people that have uh, questions, suggestions, recommendations, reach out to the folks who have been working on this um, and actually uh, take the time to, to, to give us our comments or any feedback that would help us. Um, but we do need to uh, continue to, to have all of our partners work together and that's who's going to be held responsible. We have had nonprofit organizations, delegate agencies with the city that have been submitting quarterly reports for everything else. This should not be any different. And as I believe that as of October, we will start receiving um, those reports because again, the program just started. And so people are receiving uh, as much information as they can as quickly as possible. But again, realizing that we've only had one month of the program, that's why we don't have uh, so much data yet. But the data that we do have, we have moved on. We received 1500 calls in, the, in less than two weeks. So we know that there's interest, we know that people need it, and we know that it works. Councilwoman Rocha Garcia, Councilman Trevino, thank you so much. I know we rushed through this, but uh, we got a lot of great information out. So thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on now to Advanced Transportation District Proposition A. And uh, so just reading a little bit of the ballot language on this one is to provide enhanced public transportation and public transportation mobility options. And our panelists for this item on the pro side is uh, Marina Alderete Gavito, who is on the VIA Board of Trustees. And on the anti side, not that he's against transportation, but against uh, this particular measure, Councilman Perry. And again, you will both have five minutes for your statements and then we'll get to questions. And we will start with you, Ms. Gavito. Thank you for being with us. And I will wave my hand when you get to five minutes. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm excited to be here tonight and uh, wanted to share with y'all a little bit about VIA and why we are asking for y'all's help in November. So VIA gives a passenger, we get 36 million passenger trips a year. That data is from 2019. So that each passenger trip represents us connecting a person to a job, it represents us connecting a person to a doctor's appointment, and it represents co us connecting people to their family and friends. That's 36 million passenger trips a year. That, that I, I just want us to, to, to get a grasp of that number. If you also take into consideration the average via rider is a person of color. 58% have no access to a motor vehicle. So public transportation is their only means to get around 58%. Um, our average VIA rider rides VIA to work five to six days a week. And also our average VIA rider has a household income below the poverty level. So um, you, you can see that 
public transportation is needed for our most vulnerable residents, for all residents, um, but especially our most vulnerable. You also need, should take into consideration that we provide 4,000 paratransit boardings each day. 30% of VIA riders can, do not, cannot walk and therefore cannot drive. Um, so a frequent and reliable public transportation system is key to us as a city closing the opportunity gap. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to point out with y'all, and I know that we've heard a lot of statistics tonight and there's a little bit more, but, but I, I, again, I just wanna show scale. Uh, during, uh, during the pandemic, we also need to think about 40% of San Antonio's household incomes spend almost 45% of their income on public transportation. Um, if you think about that, like what else could they be putting that money towards? Uh, schools, to food, to everything else. When, when, so again, 40% of San Antonio's households spend 45% of their monthly income on public transportation. Uh, and you know, one of the other things I really would ask us to consider is that in the SA 2020 plan, Public transportation was really one of the only levers that remained stagnant. And that's partly because we have not seen an increase in funding since 1977. I think one of the things that uh, I know as a board member I hear and probably some of y'all here is, but what about all the big empty buses? So I wanna address that. So one, VIA needs some big buses to move 36 million people around, um, but we, we are also exploring innovative ways to solve those challenges. So we're exploring mobility on demand, which is uh, we piloted with Via Link on our Northeast side. Basically you have an app, you can say, hey Via, come pick me up at my house. No more waiting at bus stops. They pick you up at your house and they take you to the closest transportation center and then you're on your way. Um, so we're looking at putting our buses in the most dense areas primarily like inside 410 um, and then using uh, expanding our mobility on demand in our less dense areas. So you could think of suburb areas that will help uh, our, more of our, many more of our customers have a good experience and easy experience, not have to wait at bus stops. One of the other great things about mobility on demand is that with it, we will be able to offer 24 hour service. That is always one of our biggest um, customer complaints is that, you know, many of our customers who are on late night shifts, third shift, what have you, cannot access via uh, at two or three in the morning. And with extended mobility on demand, they can. Uh, there, there's a whole lot of other things to, to note about our Keep SA Moving plan at keepessaymoving.com. Um, I did want to also point out that, um, got it, that with the um, with the councilman, the city had invested $10 million in additional funds uh, to VIA to focus on key on 14 key routes. What we did there is we said, okay, let's increase the frequency of those routes and see if ridership increases. What we found is ridership did increase. It increased by 28%. So it's almost kind of like if you build it, they will come. And if we provide frequent and reliable public transportation system, it will get used. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Perry. Great, thank you. And it's good to be back again for the second part here. <laughs> uh, anyway, I want to say that I am not against public transportation. And, and thanks to Marina for bringing up some of, the, some of the key points that I wanted to talk about also, but I'm not against it. I know it's needed. In fact, I was one of those councilmen that supported that additional, it wasn't a one-time $10 million, $10 million per year coming out of the city resources to help support VIA. And I was one of those that supported it. Um, but, you know, more money doesn't necessarily mean better service either. Uh, I think VIA needs to really concentrate and focus on areas that the bus system is really needed. As Marina said, they opened up some of these uh, routes that increased ridership. I think they need to do that more. Um, but overall, ridership is down. Uh, why do they need that more money at this point? Ridership is down. Um, 
we don't need to expand beyond their means. And I'll give you an example, that big, huge parking facility up there in Stone Oak or next to Stone Oak, that's mostly empty all the time. And uh, that was over $30 million that, that took to build that facility up there. Uh, they need to be more innovative. This thing with Via Link, I think was very innovative. In fact, it was my district Marina that volunteered for that because I was getting so many complaints about empty buses all the time. Let's get rid of some of those bus lines and come up with something innovative, which was a Via Link. And I totally supported that. And that's doing very well. So I'm looking forward to those additional plans for that. So, you know, I, I'm concerned about, we saw Via reimagined and now we're seeing keep SA moving. Well, to me, it's just the same, same, thing with a different wrapper on it. And one of the issues that I had with those original plans was we're going to put in dedicated uh, bus routes all over San Antonio, additional lanes, building additional lanes. That's going to cost billions of dollars for this city. And again, we keep saying how poor San Antonio is, but we keep putting more and more and more on the requirements, you know, more money, we need more money. And in this case, and a lot of what I'm seeing in this plan is we need more money to increase the frequencies. Well, is that going to really increase the ridership? And, and Marina, you said it has in some instances, but I can tell you that ridership is still down. In fact, I saw a chart that said in 2013, we had 44 million passengers, 2013. Then in 2018, it fell all the way down to 34.8 million passengers. Now you said it's 36 up in two, 2019, but that's operating under our existing resources that VIA is getting. Why not concentrate on that and improve those routes without getting additional money and see where we're going to go on that. And on top of that, I've asked for what the utilization rate is on all of those buses, all of those seats, either on a day, a week, a month, or even a year, how many seats are available out there and then how many seats are taken because that will then tell you, wow, we got a lot of empty seats on these buses that we're riding around. Maybe we need to concentrate more in the mornings or in the evenings, get rid of some of these constant buses that are riding around empty all the time. So I think that we should have a permanent allocation of tax dollars at this point that we don't know be requiring. So I'm asking everybody on this call, are you really ready to tax yourself that one eighth cent sales tax five years down the road? That means five years in the future, you're going to tax yourself. And not only that, but that tax is going to be forever and ever. We'll never be able to recall that. So what is the real requirement going to be five years down the road? I see no reason that we need to vote for this right now. We can wait. If this workforce development gets passed, we can wait towards the end of that requirement and then take a look at what our real requirements and trans nobody knows what our transportation requirements are going to be. Nobody knows what kind of cars we're going to be driving. You know, when I was a kid, we were going to all be flying in Jetsons uh, fly cars by the time it was 2000, year 2000. Well, but you know, what is future transportation going to look like five years down the road? And with technology advancing as fast as it is, I don't think we should be signing up for this right now because I say that this is an antiquated system now and it's going to be even more antiquated five years down the road. So that's my concerns with it at this point. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I, I do want to start with a couple of questions that get to the structure of uh, some of the things you brought up, Councilman. Uh, so one of the questions, um, and Ms. Gavita, we'll, we'll start with you so you can get ready for these. I'm going to give you two, though. Um, so somebody's referring to the other one, saying that um, San Antonio's Proposition A is for a maximum of eight years. Proposition B cannot extend past December 2025. Why does the advanced transportation proposition have no end date? or maximum dollar amount. How does San Antonio justify using this tax for ATD forever? And then another question on structure, 
why are voters being asked to approve this in November 2020 when it would not come into being until January 2026? A lot can change in five years. Sure. Uh, thank you for those questions. So one of the things I think that it's important for all of us to understand is VIA has been historically underfunded. When we look at our neighboring cities in Texas, Austin, Houston, Dallas, you know, we see that they are able to do so much more because they are properly funded with the full cent of sales tax. So San Antonio is not there yet. We, we um, are via CEO often has a good analogy that we have to spread this peanut butter thin, but meaning that we have to offer service to San Antonio and surrounding cities on, on very minimal, uh, on a very minimal budget. So the, to answer the question of why does this have no end date, it's because VIA is underfunded and we were trying to right size uh, that, that, uh, but the budget for us. Um, I think the second question was, what was the second question again? Why, do, why would we vote on it now when it would not be enforced for five years? Sure, great question. Uh, that was us in talks with the mayor about, and working through, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Is there ways we can work through with the, the workforce training program? So that's why that came about. If, if we had it our way, we'd have it tomorrow, but you know, it's, it's just us working with the best interests of the city. And could you, before I go to the councilman, just to clarify for people, can you just real briefly explain the difference uh, between ATD and VIA? Well, ATD oh. is the taxing entity, and that's how we can legally uh, ask for that amount of money. Uh, VIA is not the taxing entity. It's, they get their money through the ATD, and so that's Advanced Transportation District, and that's that's why it's worded that way on the ballot language, which, you know, I don't think VIA is even listed on the ballot language. So um, yeah, that's that's the reason why. Okay, thank you. There had been, there's some confusion with that with voters. Um, and I think people need to understand that the VIA board essentially is also the ATD board yeah. um, in different format. Yes. Uh, Councilman Perry, would you like to respond any more to the um, in perpetuity, why five years in advance you had raised that as well? Well, and I, I think I said that in my comments, there's no reason in this world that we need to vote five years in advance of them getting this one eight cent sales tax. There's no reason in the world to do that. We can wait, we can wait till after this for workforce training is done or, you know, let's put it on the ballot after that, if that even gets passed. But here, here's, I think part of the issue was Let's say if the workforce training or workforce development doesn't get passed. Well, if that fails, VIA is going to fall right into that spot. They will then automatically get that one eight cent sales tax on day one after the November election. So if workforce training fails, VIA is sitting there with their hand out ready to start taking that one eight cent sales tax. And I, 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 I'm pretty sure that's the way it would happen, but for right now, I say we don't know what the requirements are going to be five years down the road, much less what kind of cars we're going to be driving, what kind of uh, transportation systems there will be. There might be something else that comes out that's a, wow, that's a great idea. And all this planning and uh, the voting and everything that we're going through now will all go out the window. And the, the forever thing, yeah. That, that's another issue. You know, we're not doing pre-K for SA that way. Uh, everything else pretty much has a time limit on it or a dollar uh, limit on it. I think the voters should have a say in that on where they want their tax dollars to continue to go to fund all of these different projects around. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it should have that either a forever, uh, no end date. I want to make sure we clarify this point because I'm not sure that's correct. Um, I, I think from uh, people I talked to today that if um, COSA Proposition B fails and ATDA passes, that it would still wait until 2026 to begin collecting the tax. So that's okay, that's that, that, what the ballot measure is. Um, that, Marina, can you confirm that? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I stand 
I stand corrected on that. That's what I was told initially. And again, everybody had all kinds of questions about all three of these propositions. And that was what was explained to me back then. But uh, even, you know, that makes the argument even stronger. Why do we have to do it now? Why not wait until that time gets here so that we have a clarity in the program what the requirements are? And that is why we're here to clarify some of those confusions that people have. Um, Marina, a question, and somebody actually did uh, read the ballot language, and this is not everything that's listed, uh, but they have asked for some clarification on each of these phrases used in the ballot language. What will this actually mean? Uh, so they point to passenger amenities, innovative advanced public transportation, and public transportation mobility enhancement. And I think you, you got to the last one, but um, Marina, if you could uh, address for a voter who wants to know what exactly do those things mean in the ballot language? Sure, it was passenger amenities. And what was the second one? I'm sorry. Innovative advanced public transportation. Yeah. Um, so passenger amenities are bus stops, you know, and, and everything to, to make the passenger experience good. Uh, transportation centers, our transit centers are, are transit hubs and, and bus stops. So that's what we mean by there, uh, by that. Um, I know that San Antonio and has one of the, I think one of the highest percentage of shaded bus stops um, in Texas, which is very important in Texas, uh, but it, we would be increasing that. For the um, innovative advanced, I think it was, I'm sorry, you said it innovative advanced rapid transit? Public, not rapid, just innovative advanced public transportation. Sure. Yeah, so this this is actually uh, what we would do with that money would, would be to be, would be increasing that mobility on demand, which was what I was refer referencing earlier. Think of Via Link, where you have the app, you can call the Via Shuttle to your house uh, to pick you up, and then it takes you to a transportation center. We are looking at different ways that Via can move people around versus versus just buses. Um, so think, you know, right now we're exploring different ways on should VIA be partnering with rideshare companies? What does that look like? How can we move people around um, frequently and reliably, reliably and consistently um, to our city, in our city? All right, Councilman, any comments on that? Well, um, I, don't, I don't know what those really mean. Uh, it, it would be great to have that kind of detail out there also on what, what, is, really, what is really meant and how much money would be going to each one of these? That's not identified. It's not. Uh, it's not listed out out there anywhere. So, again, uh, you know, this is a at this point a very mushy plan at best on what this is going to be used for, and you know, why is it going to take this entire one eight cent sales tax? All right, and I'm going to. Um finish this one with a similar question uh, to the last one, and we'll start with you, Councilman Perry. Again, getting back to the uh, idea that this does not include reauthorization by voters. So if this does in fact pass, um, can you explain to us exactly how it will work in terms of overseeing, who will oversee it, um, how can the public play a part in overseeing the program's financial and performance accountability? Okay, um, well, Absolutely, would need need oversight. Of course, VIA has their own board, of which Marina sits on that, and uh, they would be uh, responsible for this program and the expenditure of funds, the budgeting for it, and, and the execution of, of those programs. And I think the public has an opportunity to always comment on that. Um, uh, city Council certainly could make comments on that and provide input into those programs. So. Uh, absolutely, but I haven't seen anything specifically on what the plan is for this, whether they would use the existing uh, uh, structure to manage this program or if they would institute some additional uh, checks and balances along the way to make sure that that money is going in the right place and it's being spent the right way. But again, there's no reason to be doing that this November for something that won't even start for another five years down the road. And that's where I have the biggest issue at. Um, why do we need to do this now? Let's wait until we know what the requirements are. And wow, 
five years down the road, a lot can happen between now and then. So that's, that's my comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gavito, how do we handle accountability for this additional time? Yeah, I did want to, to really quick answer that this is VIA's only funding source. So this is why, uh, Councilman Perry, to your point about why now, this is why we're going after it right now, because, you know, again, VIA has been historically underfunded uh, and we need to go for this. Uh, we're not going to let an opportunity pass us by. But talking about transparency, uh, on VIA's website, we have a dashboard that is fully transparent about the rights we give, about our customer service satisfaction. Um, it has a lot of metrics that you can see and um, and and people can judge for themselves how, how well we're doing. I mean, we also have a public meeting every month that people can engage with. One of the other things is, um, you, I mean, VIA has always been extremely transparent with um, our customer service, our budgets, our reports. Um, so all of that is out in the open for anybody to consume. And the other ways that people uh, can engage if they wanna learn more is we have a VIA uh, transportation community council and that's been a great way for us to engage with the community and and hear their needs hear their concerns and take that direct feedback to the board we also have our advanced transportation accessibility committee uh, for our paratransit riders to give open feedback at all times so and these are not quarterly meetings these aren't biannual these are monthly meetings that we're getting that feedback and input and also sharing all of our data. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I believe we will end with that. I wanted to thank um, Ms. Gavito, Councilman Perry, all of our panelists. Thank you for being so polite and not interrupting one another or me. And um, thank you all for your public service. And I just wanna remind everybody watching that these propositions will be at the very end of your ballot. So hang in there, you need to get through the whole ballot. And um, thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn it back to Madhu. And again, thank you to all the panelists and, and to our audience this evening. Yes, on behalf of the league, I want to thank everyone, especially all the voters. I'm very impressed that you are sticking till the end. So these ballot questions are definitely important in your minds also. And I certainly hope that you get got at least some answers to your questions. And as Francine was mentioning earlier, go to vote411.org. A lot of the information is available there. And we will also be putting the recording of this session on vote411.org and also on our website. So if you have friends who would like to uh, listen to this, you know, you can direct them to that. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Francine Romero and all our panelists, Kate Rogers, Councilman Clayton Perry, Councilman Trevino, Councilwoman Garcia, and Marina Gavito for participating this evening. A special thanks to all the voters, as I said, make sure you vote early and vote safe. We want to thank the, our co-sponsors, Can We Talk and the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame. The last but not least, I want to thank our webinar host this evening, Kim Tyndall and Associates for doing such a good job and uh, allowing us through this medium, educate the voters. Thank you all and good night. <laughs>